Well, praise the Lord. This is Pastor Wiggins of the New Horizons Church, and I want to welcome you to our next installment of Vision to Victory. This is our Leadership Development Institute, where we get together and have iron sharpen iron and look at some leadership principles that will help us to expand the kingdom of God and equip the saints for the work of the ministry that we have to do together. New Horizons, if I haven't already told you, Happy New Year. I'm excited about what the Lord is gonna do with us in 2016. Of course, our vision has not changed. It's still a 5G vision based on Acts chapter two, verse 40 through 47. We wanna be a church that's on the go. We wanna share our faith in personal evangelism so that other people can come into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We wanna grow in discipleship and development through dynamic ministry. We wanna to gather together in fellowship, engaging church fellowships where we get to know one another and share with one another and love on one another. And we wanna worship the Lord. We wanna express our gratitude toward God through spirit-filled worship. And then of course, we wanna be a church that is a generous church in our giving through biblical stewardship with practical application. It's a 5G vision to go, to grow, to gather, to be grateful and to be generous. And so while our vision hasn't changed, I'm excited about our theme for this year. 2016 is going to be the year where we continue to grow in Jesus and share generously. We're gonna to continue to grow up in Jesus and do things the way the Lord has called us to do it. And in the process, we're gonna share our talents and our gifts and our times and our abilities to expand the kingdom of God and to bring him glory. And so I'm excited because I've been praying about how we're going to do that together this year at the New Horizons Church. And one of the things that I think God is calling us to, actually I know God is calling each one of us to, is to create a culture in our church where volunteers can literally go from vision to victory. We want to create a culture in our church where volunteers love volunteering, they're excited about coming and doing ministry in the house of the Lord and for the kingdom of God, and that you are equipping those volunteers to be the best that they can be in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a word or in a phrase, we want to create an atmosphere of excellence as it relates to our volunteer service unto the Lord. And so what I want to do over the next few moments, over the next 30 to 45 minutes that I have to share with you on this video, is to share with you what I believe are six critical principles out of God's word that he shared with me in my prayer time with him that if we apply or apply those six principles to our ministry, I believe we're going to create a kingdom-minded, volunteer-centered ministry for our volunteers to get involved in. Six principles, let me give them to you uh, as a summary and then we'll dive into each one of them in some detail. Number one, if we're going to have a volunteer church uh, where people can go from vision to victory in ministry, we're gonna have to make sure that our ministries have been evaluated relative to our priorities. In other words, making sure that what we're doing in the individual ministries of the church line up with the overall vision of the church. In other words, how are we helping the church to go and to grow and to gather and to be grateful and to be generous in the various ministries that we're in? So we need to evaluate our priorities, make sure they're aligned with the vision. Secondly, after we evaluate the priorities, we need to engage the people engage their head and their heart in the ministry and the work of the Lord and the service of the Lord. Help them find their spiritual gift and ask them to literally get involved and put their hands to the plow to begin to work for the Lord. And then of course, people always need encouragement. So after we've evaluated our priorities, engaged the people, the third principle that we want to do is make sure we are encouraging the people in ministry. You as a leader and myself, our words matter our thank yous, our gratitudes, our words of encouragement, literally pour strength into the people to do the work of the Lord. Sometimes ministry can be discouraging, but we as leaders can encourage those who we have engaged to be involved in the ministry. And then of course, it takes more than encouragement. People need equipment. So we need to equip the people for the work of the ministry. That's what Paul told the church at Ephesus, that the ministerial staff, the people in leadership, their job, the pastors, are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We need to give our ministry volunteers the tools that they need, the resources that they need to be able to get the job done and done with excellence in the spirit of God. 
And then number five, we want to make sure we are empowering our people. Give them a mission. Show them the vision. Show them the purpose for the ministry. Equip them with the tools and encouragement that they need. And then empower them through God to do great things for him. And then, of course, when people are successful and when they put in the hard work and the results come, we want to elevate them. We want to celebrate the people, elevate what God has done through them because God gets the glory when people use their gifts for him. So those are the six principles. Evaluate our priorities, engage the people, encourage the people, equip the people, empower the people, then elevate the people. If we do that, those six principles through the course of this year, I believe we're going to see our ministry go to another level. We're going to see people come out of the pews, being excited about finding their gift and getting involved in the work of the ministry. And we're going to see God's kingdom expand. We're going to see our church grow. We're going to see disciples develop. And we're going to glorify God with the gifts that we've been given. So here's what I want you to do. Get some quiet time, some quiet space with the Lord. Praise God. I hope you've set this time aside. Get you a cup of coffee or your favorite beverage and sit down with a pen and a piece of paper and pray to the Holy Spirit that he will use me and our time together to share with you and sharpen you as iron sharpens iron in the word of God about how you can help take this ministry, this church, and create a volunteer culture where volunteers can go from vision to victory and God can get the glory. I'm going to be right back with our first principle and I'll look forward to talking to you. God bless. Amen. Well, welcome back. I praise God. Hope you've got your pad, your pencil. You got a comfortable place. You've prayed to the Lord and you've sought his face. Let's dive into these six principles in a little bit more detail as we try to create a culture that honors God in the areas of our volunteers and our ministry. We talked about principle number one is to evaluate the priorities in our ministry. If you remember last year at the close of the year, we talked so much about the importance of setting God centered goals, setting God sized goals for our church. We talked about the 5G vision of our church that's based on Acts chapter 2, verse 40 through 47. A church on the go, a church that grows, a church that gathers, a church that's grateful, and a church that is generous in our giving. We need to make sure that each ministry in our church is aligned in its purpose to carry out that vision. And in the parking lot, in hospitality, in the sound ministry, in the voices of worship, the music ministry, worship arts ministry, and the security ministry, children's church, whatever ministry it is, we need to ask the question, how is what we are working on advancing the vision of the church? How is it hitting one of those five G's in our vision? Or maybe it's hitting multiple G's in the vision, or maybe it's hitting all of the G's in the vision. Whatever it is, we need to make sure if we're doing it, it's advancing the vision. And one of the things that I think we need to do is to make sure that we're focused on what is most important. We can't do everything and we can't do everything at the same time. So what we want to focus in on is what God has called us to do first. And that's advance the vision. Make sure the ministry is on purpose, but then make sure the ministry is also operating in its strength. Each ministry has one thing that it does well, and we need to capitalize on that and continue to build upon that. Whether it's the parking lot, and I've seen the brothers and sisters who serve in the parking lot, they do a great job of going above and beyond to make sure that our people who come to New Horizons Church and the visitors feel welcomed here. I remember after our flood, and we had to have people park across the street because the parking lot was flooded. Some of our men in the volunteer ministry took it, on, took it upon themselves to walk some of our senior saints across 75th Street to make sure that they got to church safely and securely. Their cars were already parked. Theoretically and technically, the parking lot ministry had done its job, but it didn't stop there. It went in above and beyond to make sure the hospitality was shown to our most elder of members. And when it's raining and it's inclement weather, you'll see those men and women go out there with umbrellas because they have a strength in the area of hospitality. We need to build upon that. Our children's church, they have a, a gift, they have a strength of really embracing and loving our youth. And it's beyond just teaching them Bible verses, it's beyond teaching them what the Word of God says. It's really a love for who they are 
and it shows up in the hugs that we get in the hallways and how our children run up to our teachers and, and want to talk to them and tell them how they're doing, not only at church, but in school and in sports and academics and athletics. And so we have developed a culture in children's church where we really care about our youth and what they're doing, both in the four walls of the church and out in the community. We need to build on that. And so we need to focus in on making sure that whatever ministry it is, and I could go through all of the various ministries in our church and find out what one strength that you have. I wanna challenge you today, as you get ready to go into 2016 and have your ministry meetings, begin to plan and prepare to share that uh, ministry plan with your team, to do a couple of things. I want you to take some prayer time and, and begin to consider the plans that you have and ask yourself this question. Is what we're planning to do this year going to the, advance the vision? And if so, how is it advancing the vision? Then ask this question. Are there any things that we're doing that are not really advancing the vision? They may be good things to do, but they may not be things God has called us to do. Sit down as a ministry leader and really spend some quality time in the presence of the Lord over the next few minutes, even after this video, and really sit and ask God, what plans does he want in place in your ministry area to help advance the vision? And then ask the Lord, Lord, what does our ministry do well? What do we really uh, capitalize on? What do we really major in? What is the strength of our ministry? What are the strengths of the ministry workers that are working in our ministries? And let's build upon that, build upon our strengths. Sure, we have some weaknesses. Sure, we have some things we need to improve upon. Sure, we have some things we need to fill holes and gaps in, but, but let's focus on our strengths. Let's focus on what God has already given us and build on that and trust him to fill in the other areas. So over the next few minutes, I want you to take some time, press pause on the video and think about the priorities of your ministry and are they aligned with the vision of the church? And if they're not, they're not, make an adjustment, make some changes, say no to some things, start doing some things differently, and then figure out what the strengths are. Identify those strengths and begin to ask God to show you how to build upon those strengths as we go forward in 2015, 2016. Again, six principles. The first one is to make sure we're evaluating the priorities in our ministry so that they are advancing the vision of the church. Uh, take a few moments and I'll be back to share with you the second principle about how we engage people to carry out the purposes of the ministries that we have. I'll be back in just a moment. God bless. Welcome back. Um, hopefully you had uh, some good quiet time with the Lord, uh, evaluating the priorities of your ministry and making sure they align with the 5D, 5G vision of our church. Um, the second principle after we've evaluated our priorities is we want to now engage the people. Um, once we've got the priorities straight and we know where we're focused on and we have our strengths lined up, we want to engage the people to join us and join God where he's working. And uh, you want to know why people join ministry? They join ministry for a lot of reasons. I've read a lot of books, done a lot of research, talked to quite a few people here at our church and other ministries, and people give all kinds of reasons for getting involved. They want to be a part of the fellowship. Um, they feel like God has called them to ministry and to work and to serve in their church. They feel like, hey, if I get involved in ministry, I'll meet some new friends. And certainly um, there are a lot of relationships that are develop, developed in the ministry. Uh, some people just want to be uh, involved at a deeper level in their church. And they have a, a desire to see God do some great things through them and through the ministry. But the number one reason that people get involved in ministry, it's a little three letter word. It's so simple but powerful someone ask them to get involved. A-S-K, ask. And when we ask people to get involved, more often than not, they say yes, and they come and get involved simply because someone asked. And as we think about 2016, I wanna challenge you to begin to think and prioritize asking people to get involved in the church, in the ministry where you're working. And as you think about asking, there's a couple of characterizations of this this asking I want you to consider. First of all, we should ask prayerfully. Before we ask people to get involved in the work of the Lord, we should ask the Lord who he wants to get involved for the work. He said in his word, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send workers out into his vineyard. Before Jesus picked his 12 disciples, 
he went into prayer all night long to his father. And once he came out of prayer, he went and asked each disciple, come, follow me. Come, and I'll make you fishers of men. Come, let's do the work of the kingdom together. We should spend time in prayer so that when we ask the people, it's a prayerful ask. And then secondly, we should ask personally. Um, when Jesus, again, asked his disciples to get involved, he didn't delegate it to someone else. He didn't send an angel to do it. He went to them personally, looked them in the eye, and said, hey, join me as we turn the world upside down, or in God's eyes, right side up. And when God asked those disciples, they joined him and their lives were never the same. We should ask people personally. In fact, that's how you got involved in church here at New Horizons. I asked each one of you to get involved personally and serve in one of the ministry areas that you're serving in now. Many of the people that are in your ministry are there because you asked them personally. But not only should we ask prayerfully and personally, we should ask purposefully. What do you mean, Pastor? When we ask people to get involved, we ought to tell them the purpose of the ministry, the aim of the ministry, where the ministry is going, and why we are going in that direction. That should be one of the first things we talk about, is what are we trying to accomplish in hospitality, in children's church, in the worship arts ministry, in security, men's ministry, women's ministry, Andrew ministry, whatever ministry, wellness ministry, uh, education, whatever ministry it is, as we talk about getting involved, make the purpose clear, make the target visible, help them to see what we are trying to accomplish for God and why. When people know the purpose, they often can get involved in the plan. But not only should we ask purposefully and personally and prayerfully, but we should ask passionately. We should have a passion about inviting people to get involved in the work that we're in. We should be passionate about the work that we're in and our passion should be contagious. And when we appeal to people's heads and hearts, they have a greater chance of being fulfilled in the ministry that they get, that they get involved in. What I mean by asking passionately is appeal to their intellect, explain to them intellectually how they can get involved, how much time it's going to take, what skills and gifts are required, what is the outline of the job description, what are we going to be doing, when are we going to be doing it, with whom are you going to be doing it. Appeal to their heads so they intellectually know what they're going to be called to do, but also appeal to their heart. Let them know the fruit that comes from serving in your ministry. Let them know the joy that comes from having people be blessed by the ministry that you are part of. And when we engage their head and we engage their heart, their passions are ignited. And when they join, you'll have a volunteer who's on fire because you've engaged them passionately. But we have to be careful because when you ask with purpose and with passion, we want to be careful that we don't ask with pressure. We don't want to pressure people to get involved. You can pressure somebody and they'll say yes at the time when you ask them, but they'll never return your phone call. They'll never get your email uh, and return that because they felt pressured to do it. And they might say yes, just to relieve the pressure. So we don't want to put pressure on them and tell them we need you. And if you don't do it, we don't know who else is going to do it. God doesn't operate like that. If they're not ready or if this is not their season, this is not their time. God always has someone else who can do it. So we don't want to put undue pressure on people and make them feel guilty about working for the kingdom of God. They will be convicted by the Holy Spirit themselves. They don't need us to put pressure on them. So we want to ask without pressure. And then lastly, want to ask personally, want to ask prayerfully, want to ask purposefully, want to ask passionately without pressure. But then sixth and finally, we want to ask periodically. That means that on your calendar, whether it's once a month, every other month or every quarter, there should be a time in your ministry calendar and a strategic plan where you're going to ask people to get involved. And some of you may be saying, Pastor, I'm already set. My ministry team is fine. I've got a full boat. I'm good. But there may be some other people in these pews behind me on Sunday morning who would love to join you where you're working, but they're just waiting for you to ask. Or maybe you're saying, Pastor, I do ask people, and they, they turned me down in 2014. They turned me down in 2015. That's okay. Periodically ask them again, because you never know. The time may be right this year. The time may be right this month. 
Maybe something changed in their life. Maybe they're in a different season. Maybe they've grown. Maybe they've matured. Maybe God has spoken to their heart. And we need to give them another opportunity to say yes. We've got to ask periodically. Set up a schedule and a time for you and your team to set aside to go out into the church and to begin to think about who prayerfully you can ask personally about purposefully and passionately getting involved in the ministry and watch God do something amazing when we simply ask. Jesus said, we have not because we ask not. That if we go to our heavenly father and simply ask, he would do it for us. And I believe the same principle is true with our brothers and sisters. Sometimes we don't get the assistance that we need because we don't ask people to assist us. Here's what I'd like for you to do. Take some quiet time now uh, before I come back with the third principle and just begin to write down some names, begin to pray. And as God reveals names to you, write down some names of people that you say, you know what, I'm going to ask them to see if they're not currently serving in another ministry, would they like to serve with me in the ministry God has called me to do? Maybe you don't know their name, but you know where they sit in the congregation on Sunday. And you're going to walk up to them and introduce yourself because they've, they've been on your mind. You've seen their face and you want to know their name and you want to ask them to get involved in ministry. Maybe you've asked them before, but you, you want to re-engage them and say, hey, I know I asked you last year or last month or last quarter, but has anything changed? And I want to tell you some new things we're going to be doing in 2016 that you might want to be a part of. But write their names down, pray over it, and then take that step of faith and just simply ask. Small word. A-S-K, but it has big dividends. Let's ask people to get engaged. Let's engage people in the ministry process. I'll be right back with the next tip. Well, welcome back. Um, I pray again your time with God has been productive and fruitful. We've gone through two of the principles for creating a healthy environment in church where people can volunteer and go from vision to victory in their volunteering and in their ministries. We've talked about evaluating our priorities. We've talked about engaging people by simply asking. Now we want to have a plan for encouraging those people who have been engaged and have decided to become a part of the ministry. Encouragement is such a powerful, powerful tool in the life of a believer. When we are encouraged, that means we are infused with a confidence. We are infused with courage to accomplish the task that is at hand. We're not ignorant of the enemy's devices. He comes to threaten us and to kill and to steal and to destroy. But we know we have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we want to do is encourage our ministry workers in the work that they have to do so that when they get discouraged, there's someone there to encourage. You know what? Encouragement is such a powerful tool. Um, somebody did a study and they uh, determined that when you are affirming someone, it is multiplied 10 times in their mind. In other words, if you tell somebody they did a great job or they did an awesome job with a particular project or they, they knocked it out of the park, if you will, on a particular assignment, it says they replay that over in their mind at least 10 times. Man, I did a really good job. Man, somebody really appreciated me. That, that affirmation gets multiplied 10 times in the mind of someone who receives it. So here's what we want to think about doing with our volunteers. Uh, come up with a, a schedule where you are identifying people that are doing well in the ministry, that may be doing little things or they may be doing big things or something in between, but take some time to walk up to them and say thank you. Walk up to them and say, I really appreciate you. Walk up to them and say, you know what? Last week or yesterday or today even, you did a great job. And I just wanted you to know, I acknowledge that, I appreciate that, and I affirm you in the job well done. Pat them on the back, give them a handshake, give them a hug. Let them know that you are affirming the work that they've done. You never know how far your encouragement may send somebody in the work that they've been called to do. And maybe uh, if you don't get a chance to do it personally, spend some time writing a handwritten note. You know, a handwritten note is so personal and you can put in there what you want and fill it out. Doesn't have to be a long missive or a long letter, but you can just write a handwritten note on a note card or 
or a piece of paper, seal it, put a person's name on it, hand it to them or make sure they get it somehow. When they open that, that note up, you never know. It might be exactly what they needed when they needed it as a word of encouragement. And if encouragement is important, here's what that same study said about criticism. If an encouraging word is multiplied 10 times in the life of somebody's mind, criticism is multiplied 20 times. Think about that. When we criticize people, it gets multiplied twice as much as a word of encouragement. So what that means as a ministry leader, what that means as a pastor, we have to be very careful with our words of criticism because it gets multiplied twice as much as words of affirmation and it gets multiplied some 20 times in a person's mind. That means they will replay over and over and over again the criticism that they receive. Now that doesn't mean that ministry has to be all blue skies, green lights, and peace down the avenues of our ministry. There are going to be some problems. There are going to be some potholes. There are going to be some mistakes. There are going to be some missteps. And we as ministry leaders and we as people who are trying to grow the ministry are going to have to challenge our people to do better and do things differently and, and, and do things at a higher level. We're going to have to give out criticism. That is just a part and a fact of life. But we want to be very careful about the criticism we do give because that criticism can have a negative impact well beyond what we could have ever considered. So here's what I want you to think about, a couple of things with regard to criticism. Carefully consider the criticism that you think you might need to give to a ministry teammate. And if you feel warranted in giving it after praying to God and you have to have that conversation, be prayerful about how that conversation goes. And one of the tips that I learned in corporate America is not to sugarcoat the criticism, but do find something that the person has done well and sandwich the criticism in between what they've done well and tell them how they can improve in the job that they're trying to do. And then close out with thanking them for their effort, thanking them for their presence, thanking them for their gifting, thanking them for who they are in Christ Jesus. Even if they failed miserably in their ministry task, they are still somebody in Christ Jesus and we can thank God for them being a Christian, filled with his Holy Spirit, blood bought and blood washed. We can always find something positive to say about someone, even if they have an area where they've fallen short. So here's what I want you to do is be careful with the criticism, but be uh, overly anxious to give somebody words of affirmation. So we wanna balance that out and make sure you remember Affirmation is multiplied 20 times in the mind of the hearer and criticism, excuse me, affirmation is multiplied 10 times in the life of the hearer. Criticism is multiplied 20 times. So we have to be very careful about how we criticize. Here's what I'd like to do in your private time with the Lord. We're going to take a break, uh, but I want to challenge you uh, to go through your ministry roster, even maybe beyond your ministry roster, people in other ministries, and try to think about something you saw someone doing that went well. It might be a small thing, it might be a big thing, or again, it might be something in the middle. And make a point over the next seven days, you're going to find a way to tell that person what a great job they've done. Can I tell you on Sunday morning when I'm preaching my heart out and giving the best that I got, sometimes I don't know if I made a difference or if I made a dent in the lives of the people that I'm preaching to, but on Monday morning, it never fails. Someone sends me a text message, an email, or a phone call, or sees me in the store somewhere and says, Pastor Wiggins, your word really impacted my life. And just that word of encouragement spoken at the right time gets me back on the horse, ready to go back in my prayer time, go back in my study time to preach the gospel again. And if I need it, surely I know someone else needs it as well. Someone on your team is starving for affirmation and you can be just the person to give it to them. So what I want you to do is make a list of people that you think that you can empower over the next seven days with words of affirmation. Encourage them in the work that they're doing. And guess what? You end up reaping what you sow. If you're sitting there saying, I need somebody to encourage me. Well, maybe, just maybe, if you begin to encourage someone else, you'll reap what you sow and God will send some people to encourage you. That's the, that's the third principle. First principle, evaluate our priorities. Second principle, engage the people. Third principle is encourage the people to do the work of the ministry. I want you to sit back, 
Think about those things we just talked about, and I'll be back with the fourth, pr fourth principle in just a moment. Well, welcome back and praise the Lord. We're halfway through um, with the six principles that I believe are gonna help us take our ministries to the next level and create a volunteer culture, a ministry culture where our ministry workers can literally go from vision to victory. Let's review the first three principles. Number one, evaluate our priorities. Make sure they're lined up with the vision. Number two, engage the, principle, engage the people. Simple principle, just ask. And number three, we want to encourage the people. Speak a word of encouragement. Be careful with our criticism, but be lavish with our words of affirmation. Principle number four is really critical. It is equip the people for the work of the ministry. Again, Paul in the, uh, Ephesians chapter four to the church at Ephesus, he told the leadership of the church that the pastor's role, the leadership role is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And that's exactly what we wanna do. We want to give our people the equipment they need in order to carry out the work that they've been called to do. You know, when a soldier goes into the armed forces or goes into a battle, um, they sign up, but it's the armed forces or the government that has the responsibility to equip them to win the battle, to give them whatever they need to get the victory over the enemy. So it is with a soldier, so it is with a salesperson. The most talented salesperson still needs a product to sell. They still may need a brochure or a computer or a sales car, some uh, information to be able to com convey to their customer what they are trying to sell. And if you give that salesperson the resources they need, they can meet the objectives of sales that they have. And even in the area of surgery, doctors that are operating in operating rooms, they, they need certain tools, they need certain procedures, they need certain medical devices to help them perform the surgery that's going to help the patient get off the table and live a normal, healthy life. Even though the surgeon is smart and is educated, they still need equipment in order to be a successful surgeon. So it is with a soldier and a salesperson and a surgeon, so it is with a servant of the Lord. We need to equip them for the work of the ministry, give them the proper tools to help them to be successful. In fact, we should make them stars in the ministry, S-T-A-R-S. That's what we should do for our ministry workers. Number one, S means we should speak well of them in all situations and at all times. Find something good to say about our ministry workers, both in their presence and out of their presence. We want to set them up for success, speaking well of them, speaking well of what they've done. Sure, we can find what they don't do, but take some time, as we talked about before, and find what they do do well and speak well of that person, make them a star. And then T, train them to be a star. Give them the proper training and have manuals in place and policies and procedures so that they know what they're doing when they show up to do ministry. I remember the first time I served in my home church, big ministry, I was coming, I was excited to do something uh, for the church and for the kingdom of God and for God himself and showed up for ministry and uh, asked them what they wanted me to do and, I was just given an assignment to go do X, Y, or Z with no training on how to do it. And about 20 minutes into it, I was frustrated. I knew I wasn't doing a good job, hadn't been trained, uh, didn't go as I had wanted it. And I purposed in my heart then, I said, you know what, if I ever get a chance to lead anybody in ministry, one of the first things I'm going to make sure is that they're trained on how to do the work. Nothing more frustrating than coming out to do something for the Lord and feeling inadequate and untrained. We want to train our people. And then we want to uh, not only train them and not only speak well of them, but we want to make sure that they know what their assignments are. We want to make sure they know and are aware of what it is that their action items are supposed to do week to week and month to month. If they're going to be a star, they got to know what their assignment is, what they're supposed to be a star at doing. And if we make their assignment clear and give them a job description with bullet points and give them a time frame in which to do it and give them an outcome in which we're looking for, we're going to make them stars because they're going to be clear what my assignment is. We speak well of them, we train them, we make sure they know their assignment, but then the R is we give them resources. Everybody needs resources to get things accomplished and resources don't always have to cost a lot of money. Maybe somebody just needs 
uh, a pen and a piece of paper and a clipboard to sign the people up for the ministry or to, to get the ministry word out. They may need uh, an email address. They may need uh, some access to website. or They may need uh, us to, to provide them with phone numbers or information. Whatever it may be, we need to give them the resources that they need to be successful. And then finally, the S in STAR stands for service. Not only do we want to speak well of, them, well of them, not only do we want to train them, not only do we want to make sure they know what their assignment is and give them the resources, but we want to be a service to them. We want to treat them almost like our customer. Really, in a way, they are our customer. We want to quickly and often ask them, what can I do to make your assignment easier? How can I serve you? Here's a great phrase, help me help you. If you help me, I'm trying to help you. Sometimes it's simply coming alongside and helping them do the task. You know, there's nothing more encouraging than for somebody to give you an assignment and then they come alongside and help you to accomplish the task that has been given. You know, that's what God does with us. He gives us an assignment, but he gave us the Holy Spirit and he helps us to accomplish what he's assigned us to accomplish. And he makes us look like stars. And that's what we should do for those who are in ministry with us. Speak well of them, train them, give them an assignment that's clear and focused, give them the resources that they need, and then serve them as our customers so that when they go out and do ministry, they can serve the people that they're called upon to serve. I wanna ask you again to take some time, pause now and, and think about how you can make the people in your ministry stars, how you can serve them and and maybe get a list of resources that you could put together to give them to do a better job and how you might be able to simplify or clarify what their assignment is. Maybe you need to train or retrain or, or, or come up with some additional training. Even if you've already gone over it, maybe you need to go over it again and then find yourself speaking well, even of the most difficult volunteers that may be on your team and watch God help them become stars in the ministry who shine bright for him. Take some time to think about that. Write those notes down. Um, we'll get a chance to discuss it together in the leadership team. Um, but I'll be back with principle number five of the six that's going to help us take our volunteer ministries from vision to victory. I'll be back in just a moment. God bless. Amen. Well, welcome back. Uh, we're at principle number five of six as we try to create a volunteer culture um, that sets people up for success, that literally makes them stars in the ministry. I hope you're um, getting something out of this. I enjoy teaching. Uh, I'm getting used to teaching via this video uh, uh, way, and, and hopefully it'll help us when we get together live to be able to engage, and it'll give you a chance to, to go over these principles in your own leisure time and and pray about it and come back to it and mull over it again. But, but I'm excited about sharing this next principle and it is empowering the people. After we evaluate their priorities, after we engage the people and ask them to get involved, after we encourage them with words of affirmation and be careful with our criticism and after we equip them to make them stars in the ministry, what we wanna do is empower them to do the work of the ministry. You know, when people get involved uh, in the work and and they learn what they're supposed to do and they're trained properly and they've given the right assignment, now it's time to kind of step back and let them do what God has called them to do. And in order to be able to do that, the first thing we wanna do is clarify what the objectives are. Clarify what the win is on a Sunday morning ministry. Clarify what the win is in the first quarter, the first half of the year. Uh, identify how we know when we've done a good job. When you clarify the objective of what we're trying to accomplish, people get empowered because they know what the goal is. You know, when people line up in football uh, to kick a field goal, um, the goal post is painted yellow. It's got two long uh, bars that, and it's got a crossbar. And everybody in the whole stadium knows that's the goal that we're aiming at. The center knows, the blockers on the line know, the holder knows, the kicker, he better know what he's kicking at and everything works toward the goal of getting that ball in position so that the kicker can kick it through the goal. And once he does it and it goes well, you wanna see that referee put both hands up and say, it is good. 
We want to clarify objectives so that at the end of the ministry week or the end of the ministry day or the end of the ministry assignment, we can put our hands up and say, it was good. So we want to clarify the objectives. And even as we clarify the objectives, um, we know that there are going to be some obstacles that come about in ministry. All of the plans that we lay uh, doesn't mean that the enemy is not going to try to sprinkle some rocks and ditches and trees and bumps in the road. And that's OK. Um, but what our job is to do as ministry leaders, to the best of our ability, is clear out all the obstacles that there may be in uh, a person's ministry uh, road, if you will. Uh, go ahead of them and find out where the challenges and pitfalls are. You've been in ministry longer, uh, most of you, and you've been serving. And so you know where some of the pitfalls are. You know where some of the challenges are. You know where the devil is lurking to try to trip people up. So go straight ahead of them and make straight their pathway so that when they get to that obstacle, it's been moved out of the way. Or at the least, you've prepared them for it so when they get to it, they're not surprised. And even as we clarify the obstacles and clarify the the, the objectives, we want to create opportunities for people to be able to serve. Um, think about your ministry and think about how it can go to the next level. How can we serve more people? How can we serve people better? How can we serve people at a different uh, level uh, than we're doing right now? And you want to create opportunities for people to serve. My goal is to see us double the number of people who are involved in the ministry here at our church this year which means we're gonna to have to double the number of the opportunities that people have to serve. And so we wanna create those opportunities through praying to God, through seeking his face, through trying to meet needs at another level. And when we create those opportunities, then we need to celebrate people who do outstanding results. Clarify the objectives, clear away the obstacles, create opportunities, but then celebrate people who stand out in their service to the Lord. Sometimes people just want a pat on the back. Sometimes people want their name spoken. Sometimes people want a card. We talked about that, a thank you note. Sometimes people want to be acknowledged. However that person wants to be acknowledged or not, find a way to celebrate people who stood out in their service to the Lord. You know, the Bible is replete with, with people who did great things and never had their name mentioned. And the Bible also has people who did great things and had their name mentioned. Some people are behind the scenes folks and some people are out in front. Some people are people who like getting credit. Some people don't mind not ever sharing the credit, but find out how that person likes to be celebrated and find a way to celebrate their outstanding achievement. Because here's what you do when you celebrate outstanding achievement. You help people understand what the objective was. You help people understand what the outcome we were searching to try to get. It's not necessarily about the person sometimes, it's about the outcome, and maybe it's not an individual. Maybe you celebrate the team because the team came together and a person got saved. The team came together and a person's need was met. The ministry team came together and worship took place and God got the glory. And so rather than just identifying one person, we can bring a group of people together and celebrate their outstanding results. When we clarify the objective, clear away the obstacles, create opportunities, and then celebrate outstanding results, God gets the glory and the people can see the fruit of their work being done in the ministry. Again, take some time in your prayer time and think about how you can do one of those four things over the next month in your ministry. Are there certain objectives you need to clarify? I know you have a ministry goal, but is it crystal clear in the mind of the people that you're working alongside? Habakkuk told us, write the vision down, make it plain so the people can run with it. Clarify those objectives. Are there obstacles that keep your people from serving? Is it too hard to serve? Is it too many hoops to jump through just to get the job done? Make it simple, clarify, clarify the objectives, clear out the obstacles, then create opportunities. Uh, even if it's a job that needs to be done once a month or once a quarter, or maybe it's a small task that somebody who doesn't have a lot of time can do, but everybody ought to be able to do something to take the load off so we can share it and then find a way to celebrate. If you need to engage me, maybe there's some ways we can do it church-wide or maybe there's ways we can do it ministry-wide or maybe it can be on an individual level, but we ought to find a way to celebrate outstanding contributions to the ministry. Well, those are the five principles. We've got one more and I'll be back in just a moment to give you that.
Well, praise the Lord, team. We're down to the last principle of our six principles that will help us take our ministry to the next level in terms of creating a world-class uh, volunteer ministry of excellence. And those six principles in, re in summary or recapping are number one, evaluate our priorities. Make sure the priorities in the ministry align with advancing the vision of the church. Number two, once we've evaluated those priorities, we wanna engage people by simply asking them to get involved in the ministry. Remember, when people are asked, they're more apt to get involved. And once they get involved, we wanna encourage them with words of affirmation, words that are positive, that encourage them to do the work that God has called them to do. And we wanna be careful and thoughtful about offering criticism. Sometimes we need to, but remember, it can have a negative effect if we don't do it in the right way. And then fourthly, we need to equip the saints, equip the ministry workers for the work of the ministry. Equip them with understanding their spiritual gift. Equip them and make them stars in the ministry by speaking well of them and training them and answering their questions and giving them the proper assignment and making sure they have the resources and making sure we serve them as, their, as our customers. We make them stars by equipping them for the work of the ministry. And then of course, number five was uh, uh, empowering, uh, making sure that the opportunities are there for ministry, the objectives are clear, the obstacles have been removed, and, and that people that are doing outstanding work get celebrated. And lastly, the fifth or sixth, I should say, principle is we want to elevate people in ministry. Uh, as God is, is developing ministries and developing people in the ministry, one of the grateful things about my role as a pastor is I get to see people grow and develop in their gifted area. I get to see them grow and develop as a disciple. And nothing warms my heart than to see a person who comes to the church and connects with Christ and connects with the church and then connects with a ministry, identifies their spiritual gift, begins to grow in that gift, and then God makes room for their gift. And as the room gets bigger, they get elevated in the ministry and they begin to do more work for God and they begin to produce more fruit for God. Man, that is an awesome feeling and an awesome thing to see God get the glory out of their lives. And so what we wanna do in ministry uh, during this year, 2016, is look for people that we can elevate in ministry. Uh, there may be some people serving in your ministry right now who have been marked for leadership. They are growing in their Christian maturity. They're growing in their Christian service. They're growing in their gifting. They're growing in their passion for the Lord. And they need more responsibility. They need to be challenged and stretched. And, and here's the thing. It may be that they, they, they don't necessarily need to lead the ministry that you're in, but there may be a ministry that God is going to start within our church and they would be a great person to be over that ministry and you've groomed them to be able to do that. You know, there are a number of people on our ministry team and in certain roles, many of you um, that started out in one area of the church, but are now working in another, another area of the church. And it's the start you got over here that helped you now function where you are. I remember when I first started working in the church, uh, the first real ministry I got involved with was the follow-up ministry. When people gave their life to Christ, I would go back and share my faith with them and share the Bible verses that helped them to understand salvation and point them in the direction that they would go uh, in the ministry. And, and even yet today, the principles that I learned in that ministry about sharing my faith and equipping the saints for the ministry and encouraging them and propelling them into what they do, uh, I'm doing that now as a, as a senior pastor. And God has elevated me, but he elevated me with the equipment that I learned in another ministry area. And so as you see people who need to go to the next level, uh, encourage them to be prayerful about God giving them a new assignment and more responsibility. Uh, maybe God wants to have you grow them up and groom them uh, to replace you so that you can go on and do things in ministry that God has called you to do. But you always want to have a list of, of ministry leaders that are ministry workers that you think have the potential for leadership so that as God expands our church and we grow in Jesus and share generously, that growth means more leaders need to be developed. We can take that list collectively, pray over it, and then put those people in the various areas of church and ministry that they need to be in. I'm excited about uh, what God is going to do with us and with you through the ministries that you are leading this year. And I'm looking forward to us creating a culture um, that we can be proud of as people come to our church and we can point them to say, you know what, when you get involved in ministry at New Horizons, you're gonna see that you can go from vision to victory by working in ministry here. I know we got a lot of work to do. 
I know our church is not perfect. I know our ministries are not perfect. I know we've got challenges. But I think if we work at these six principles, consistently evaluating our priorities, making sure they're aligned with the mission and vision of our church, continually asking people to engage in the ministry and personally and prayerfully, purposefully, passionately, and then periodically doing that, I believe we're gonna see more people get involved in the church. When we empower and encourage them to do the work that God has called them to do, empower them with the resources, encourage them with words of affirmation and consistently consider criticism and whether or not we should give it, I believe we're gonna see people get engaged at a whole nother level. And then of course, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry and elevating them when they've done a good job and seeing them grow and develop. I believe if we do that together and we do that with the power of the Holy Spirit through the guidance of God's word, we're gonna go from vision to victory. We're gonna see souls saved from the least in our children's church, the youngest of us, to those that are here in our sanctuary. We're gonna see people connecting with the church at, at record numbers. We're gonna see marriages come together and stay together. Families come together and stay together. Single people being single and satisfied. We're gonna see uh, spiritually immature people go to maturity. We're gonna see carnal people become spirit filled. We're gonna see people doing great wonders and signs for the Lord. There's gonna be all kinds of testimonies that are gonna be breaking out over our church. And I can't wait for God to come down and tell us well done our good and faithful servants because of the work we put in place so that others could have a great experience in ministry here at the New Horizons Church. I hope you embrace these principles. I hope you pray with them, uh, pray with me over them and try to apply them in your church and, or in your ministries in the church. And I look forward to hearing from you and sharing with you in our leadership meeting that's upcoming about how we can bring these principles to bear and bring them to pass in the life of the church and the ministry. God bless you. Thank you for spending time with me. I'll see you next time on Vision to Victory, our Leadership Development Institute. God bless.